everybody who was on international break, they're all available for Sunday. Yes, yes, they are all available, ready to go, fresh, and yeah, very, very happy to be back. And uh, they issued a timeline on Stian's uh, recovery and to, to return. That's still the same, right? That has not changed. Yeah, it has not changed, but uh, cautiously optimistic about it after the intervention. I think the doctors uh, were very positive about it, so we'll see how he responds after that. But we're positive that uh, might not take a long, long time. It might be a, actually a quick recovery. The partnership that Noah and Derek had uh, against Toronto, I know the conditions made things tough, but what were the good things that they did and what were some of the things that maybe they need to work on if they're paired together against Chicago on Sunday? No, I think they were pretty good, pretty solid, honestly, when you talk about the behaviors of those two and the back four in general. I think they were pretty good, pretty awesome. Um, there were a few things, maybe in the distribution, in the, not distribution, I never use that word, I'm sorry, but uh, the play from the back, the build up play, yeah. and, uh, and, and against men for men, uh, marking and identify some counter moves, stuff like that. It was tough, it was a tough game, a difficult game to, to play, especially with the conditions of the wind and, and the grass and all this. But um, uh, we talk about that, it, it was more in possession, what I was a little bit uh, more, um, uh, how I can say, coaching. Uh, but uh, out of possession, I think actually the back line had a, had, had a good game. Derek did mention that you had talked to them about just the filling in space behind. If somebody steps, you got to make sure that that space is covered. Yes, I, I think they, they were pretty good on that. It was, of course, you can always talk afterwards, the, the, the goal, you know, when, when Noah stepped up yeah. and how we just closed down that. I think Brooks did. Uh, Derek was a little bit late, but it was a great touch by the kid. So, so you have to give, give credit also to your, to your opponent. It was a great goal, but uh, yeah, things that we can do better is those principles of pressure on the ball, cover on the back, and yeah, normally do. We normally did very well. From what you've seen of Chicago thus far in 2024, what's different for them this year? I know they have Kuipers coming in, Otasta, some of the new settings. From a technical standpoint, how, does, how have those new players kind of changed things for them this year? Well, it's also the new, the new right back. I think the center backs are solid too. Uh, the new right back is a bit more solid, maybe you know, less aggressive uh, going forward, but uh, more solid. The nine for me is the one that, that that might change things for them. I think it's a pretty good nine when you look at his resume, where he's playing, and and the amount of goals he has scored. You you have to give him some respect. Um, and then obviously you cannot forget Shakiri as the, the main playmaker for them. But then Acosta again in midfield that makes them a bit more mobile and more um, you know balance in, in that part of the field and I think uh, they have a very good squad and uh, when they're in the middle block they're very tough to break um, out of that 4 4 one, one 4 4 2 uh, shape uh, they they move pretty well and then in transition they can counter very aggressive so it's kind of same ideas but probably with a couple players that can make the difference for them. It's not official yet that it will play on Sunday but there's some discussion that he might have actually what's, good, what's it going to be like having him Oh, Andrew, Andrew Goodman. Uh, yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, that's that's up to them. If he's on the field, of course, I will I will say hi, and that will be good to see him again. But you know, once the whistle blows, then then it's Atlanta versus Chicago. You mentioned the man marking that Toronto was doing. Do you expect that to be a one-off kind of thing? Uh, just maybe this one game. Where you see it all year, or are other teams potentially going to adopt some of the principles? You there are some other teams that might might, might use that. Uh, at times, you know, in the old system with the older coaches, New Red Bulls. At times, they, they they were doing that, pairing men for men. At times, you know, uh, Columbus did at times against us. And there are some some games maybe not as aggressive as Toronto did, but. Uh, but yeah, and that was only the first half, just to clarify. I think right. the second half, they they put normally two on our number nine, and then the side effect is you have one more in the build-up, as in the first half, they were very aggressive, three for three on the back, and uh, uh, Shane O'Neill stepping up all the way on Nick Firmino, uh, times very, very close to our box, so that was interesting. But uh, again, we're finding the process and continuing evolving in our process and when we face that I think we'll be more prepared because we watched the film, we, the players understood what, what we can do better in those situations and I hope next time we, we do better. Had, this is maybe impossible to answer, but if Yurgo, Santiago were there and Caleb, do you think Toronto would have gone man-to-man -man in the first half against Shaw? 
<laughs> well, it's, it's very hard to say. It's very hard to say. And I don't want to come across as, oh, yeah, the absences and internationals were not there. I had, and I had, and I have full confidence in the lineup we put against Toronto. I think uh, a lot of those players had an outstanding individual performance. Sadly, we couldn't get the three points, and there were a, a couple, you know, cohesion issues in certain partnerships in there that maybe didn't help. But uh, eventually, I think those guys are putting the work in, and, and I'm very confident. Uh, Anytime I, I use one of them, uh, they're going to respond well. It was a good test for, for, for them, and, and I think the most part I'm happy with their performance. That being said, the differences and the benefits having everybody back, both in training and for match day, I know you have to navigate these things a couple of times during the season, but what is that like to have everybody back? Yeah, you, you can see immediately the response of, of the whole squad when everyone is back. It's just they're happier. They, they, they miss their friends. I mean, here, you know, we miss the interactions with some of them. And it was six players out of the international plus Estienne that, that had a couple of days off with the injury, surgery and stuff like that. So um, once they're back, it's, everyone is happy. Everyone is trying to play today. I think they enjoy the session. They had very, very good session today. Uh, they made a couple very good plays, just one touch, and it was good to see. So uh, the quality arises, of course, but also the mood of the team is is much better. I think it's the midfield, like Chicago with Acosta, with Herbers, and with Shakiri, all guys who are very mobile, all guys who can get forward and attack. What are the challenges that presents for your midfield? Well, mobility, mobility, and uh, how we can be able to unmark ourselves. So at times, you know, when you play against two uh, center meets, like similar to I don't know uh, Orlando game, they were pressing four for two with Muriel and and and, and the nine. Um, you know, you had almost an American advantage in there. Uh, your double pivot plus Thiago against against their their double pivot. So it, it was about how we can find that that extra center meet. When you when they match you in there, it's about how you can unmark yourself and either uh, thermo pass or attacking the space in certain areas. Or at times we can find the the tactical solution to overload with an extra player in there. So we create a box or a diamond in there to create a numerical advantage. It depends on the game plan that we're putting for Chicago. But eventually we need mobility. We need to be on the front foot. We need to be constantly playing and the ball moves fast and playing and moving. Uh, that always helps when when they match the, the triangle in the middle. But uh, I, I would add that Gaston Jimenez could be playing too. And he's a very good player. Uh, I, I always appreciate the quality he brings to, to their game. So that's another possibility that, of course, will be difficult to handle uh, for, for my players. But hopefully we can give them the solutions and the tools to succeed in that game. The flip yeah. side, when they have the ball and then they're able to open up, Shakiri drifting wide, Herbert drifting wide, what challenges does that provide you defensively? Yes, yes, we have to be very alert in those transition moments. Uh, we already watched the film a little bit on the triggers that they get to, to, to be compact, but also to have a good transition moment for the moment where they regain the ball. So, again, the discipline of the players, you know, big emphasis on both fullbacks don't go at the same time, and the center meets our double pivot, always aware of the act defending, you know, keep an eye on the important players they have. It's always the same process in MLS. Most of the opponents. Uh, have a very nice 10, a very nice 9, and one or two quality wingers. So you have to be alert almost in every game. So we are uh, constantly reminding our players about the active defending, the active defending, and the balance, right? How many numbers we want in attack versus how many numbers we want in defense. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a standard nowadays. Bartek and Gigi were at Euro qualifying. And Bartek, of course, in Poland made it through. Gigi, unfortunately, did not make it through with Greece. And Gigi's been very public about his dream of playing in Euros. Um, have you had a chance to talk to him about what those emotions are at the moment? And, and so it seems like he's a player that can really channel those emotions to make himself a better player on the field. Yeah, well, I, I, won't, I won't mention too many details on our conversation. Of course, we talk, but what I can tell you is I, I expect a, a Gigi very motivated, very hungry, and, you know, he is having a very good season so far. In four games, he has uh, four goals. I think that's a pretty good average. Uh, actually, I think it's three games for him because he didn't play the last one, so it's actually four goals in three games, so it's a very good average. Um, and I expect him, you know, um, to move 
move on and to continue with his good performance in the season. And what a great opportunity to have this after a few days in the bands at home, uh, in front of all of our fans, and having this kind of you know revenge for him. It could be good. He, he's going to be motivated. He's going to be fine. How's uh, Daniel Rios' integration coming along? Good, good. Just want to share. Sorry, I forgot before uh, the kid will be out for the game. He had a little bit tightness in the calf, okay. so he'll be out. Um, yesterday, yeah, we, we, we pulled him out. Uh, but but other than that, he, he was very good. The couple sessions he did this week, he was pretty good. Uh, he's a number nine that can play also as a second striker. So kind of different char characteristics to Jamal. So it was a good signing because that gave us options in the front uh, side of the team. Um, he can be more mobile, tech, technical to drop and to handle situations, decision making when he drops and switch upon his attack. So he can be also a link of play, but then he, he can score goals. I hope one of these days you can watch him in those finishing drills. He, he can really, really score goals. So happy to have him. And I hope with repetitions, he can get more used to our movements in the final third and hopefully integrate it. Derek mentioned that he appreciates that you speak to each player on the team uh, the same way, whether they're DP, uh, homegrown, uh, whatever else. How important is that on an MLS roster uh, to essentially just treat players the same way regardless of roster status? Well, I try. I, I, I always say that I don't treat them the same. I, I would say that I give them all the same amount of respect, the same amount of attention, but at times I cannot treat the same Yakumakis versus Luke Brennan. I, at times I have to be harder on Luke Brennan. He has to earn kind of that position to, to, you know, to be treated a little bit different in certain situations. Now I demand the best of everyone in the same in every training session. That the demands are probably the same, but then how I treat them. I have to recognize that at times it's not the same, but I at least I, I, I try and my whole coaching staff helps with that to give them all attention and give them all communication and, and sessions and, and video analysis and, and individual one-on-one -on -one so they can express themselves and they can tell you, hey coach, what else I need. And, and there is constant communication because we care about the development of everyone. And, you know, uh, we try that. It's never a perfect system, but we try at least to, to give them the same amount of respect and, and demands. Gonzalo, I wanted to uh, try to have a better understanding of getting in the headspace of players and, and yourself as the coach. And it, I think it starts on like a game day um, at the beginning of the day. How do you kind of get yourself into that kind of super focused headspace that I'm sure you want to be in when a game is taking place? Can you talk about how your kind of psyche kind of morphs throughout the day until you get to those key moments of the game? Yeah, well, when I'm when I'm at home, I like to spend some some time with my family. I like to have breakfast with my family and just just kind of unplug a little bit. And then as as the day progresses and we we arrive to the stadium around five and a half hours before the game, and then I start to think about you know the little details, the reminders for the players, and my message before uh, the game, my message right after my presentation to them when I announce the game plan and the up and the little detail that we need to do but what is my main message and I have to summarize many things that I want to tell them in two or three specific things how I can get to their heart in the last moment how I can you know uh, inject a little bit of energy and passion uh, but at times they bring the passion to me because they're already excited they're already saying things but that's kind of my mental preparation is like that kind of driving to the stadium and thinking about those things what I'm gonna say then in my office trying to think about that my message the little details the roles of my coaches so I start to to put all together the game plan and, and the roles of everyone in the staff and that's the way I concentrate in in the game uh, yeah, but I cannot lie, I'm very anxious. Uh, arriving to the stadium five hours and a half for me brings anxiety at times, and I need to slow down and breathe. But uh, yeah, it depends on the games, but at times I'm a bit more anxious than normal. It's, I think it's part of, of this. And I noticed against Orlando, unless I missed it, I, I didn't see you uh, on the field watching the players warm up. I don't know if that's normal for you to not be out there. And if, I'm just curious what you are doing. Is it? When the lineups come out, are you kind of like on a tactics board, like working things out, or, or what, no. what is that? I, I'm pretty sure I was there. Okay, maybe, were you there? Okay, yeah, maybe I was a bit late, or okay. yeah, um, I tried to be there 
at the moment they start the rondos or they just finish the rondos and then there are more the long balls or the possession that's where I arrive I like to see that part of the possession see and, and feel how my team is are they sharp are they okay how's their mentality body language a little bit of the opponent how they are a little bit if I can guess certain tactical questions at times they start to build in certain situations like this guy's gonna play on the right and the left so I, I like to to have that and then I I get back to my office where I, I again I, I I refocus and, and start my process on, on my speech and that to the players. But normally I, I'm there in the warm-ups, that's, that's the answer. Do you have a time uh, when after lineups come out that you kind of need to get back with your coaches and just kind of uh, confirm the plan that you have in place based on the lineup that you see from the other team? Yeah, that's that's more organically because uh, when we receive the lineup is normally when we're about to go out to the warm-up. So okay. then some of my coaches are already out on the field and then Rob, Eugenio and Diego at times we have the time to come to area. they are going to play like this, how we put the lineup for the players. And yeah, this guy will play right, left. Or, and if we don't have the time because there are too many changes, I stay with my uh, video analyst trying to digest that and to see what other options, other lineups. And um, that's that's kind of the process. Normally it's very straightforward, but that's a process and, and the timing of that. Yeah. Do you have a pregame meal you have every time? Yes, we always, uh, as a team, when we're at home, we have a pregame meal. Yes. No, something specific that you, you oh, only eat. I, on game I normally days. don't eat uh, right before uh, that meal. I don't eat. I drink a coffee and maybe maybe some you know banana or something quick, but not uh, not a quick not a, a, a big big meal. No. How many cups of coffee do you have on a game, <laughs> on a game day? On a game day, total probably 14. Oh. 14. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You yeah, get a sponsorship. yeah, I need, get a sponsor. I need something. Sponsors, I'm here. We are here. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Appreciate it.